the invitations behind them. All right, let's start. Um, I thought your presentation was not well. Um, but and what I most enjoyed was not just looking more deeply into the project, but having a tracking character. Because, um, obviously, that, those are the ones that I'm the chair of. But I also enjoyed the, uh, the uh, discussions about the faculty who came and had some good conversation. And I hope you guys paid attention to those. I think in most cases they uh, they brought up some useful comments. And, and now um, you know, I think it's it's up to you and your chair to sort out what that implies and where we go from here. Um, We'll just meet today. We won't need to meet Wednesday uh, or Friday, so today will be the last time we get together. But I do want to remind you of the map pieces that are due Friday. Let's just say by the end of the day, by five. Uh, what works for me in order for you not to have to find me is just put them in the white box down here. That's handy, and they should be safe there. Um, and remember what the pieces are, your title and your committee, uh, your diagram, your table of contents, your abstract. Um, I don't think we need to, to, uh, to do the bibliography again or the, the work plans, just those pieces. And one reason why I'm asking for those things again is I want you to uh, take stock and revisit even if you've revisited them, revisited them as recently as was necessary to do your PowerPoint, I want you to think about those pieces again and see whether there are any current tailorings or modifications you want to make um, before you turn them in. Because as I've been preaching all through the semester, I think it's useful to keep updating what's guiding you in the process. The danger, if you don't do that, and you just get lost in the work, is you're going to get lost in the work. Uh, you're just going to begin to do things, and you're not going to be referencing your map or what you have left to do and how it relates to other things. And you're just going to work less efficiently. And chances are you're going to spend inappropriate amounts of time on things because you don't have a sense for the total. So um, even though... Uh, next semester in the thesis studio, you may not be asked for those things. 
I want to encourage you to continue to update them for yourself so that you always are working clean, you always have the project in front of you, not that it's leaking around behind you where it's out of sight and where you're not attending to it. So uh, asking for that is not just a formality. I'm hoping it's going to be that last update within this course in the anyway. It's going to be a useful taking stock, a useful gathering yourself uh, so that you can re-clarify for yourself um, what's left to do. Uh, what else do we have here in terms of um, housekeeping? Um, I don't know whether some of you have already made arrangements to do this or not, but I want to encourage all of you to meet with your chairs at least one more time before the break. Um, because even if you're not going to do any, uh, let's say, purposeful work at a desk, uh, your mind's still going to be thinking about things. My guess is you, you are going to be pushing <coughs> pieces along over the holidays. But either way, I think it's useful to have a conversation with your chair to get clear what's the most useful uh, purpose to put that time to. So that whatever you do over the, over the holidays, um, it's, it's the most effective thing and the most efficient way to, to progress the, uh, the thesis process. Also, I think it's a good idea whether you've done it yet or not just to meet with them to take stock of how they thought the presentation <coughs> I know probably in all your cases you did a little rehearsal with your chairs, but just a little debriefing I think is, is a useful thing, so I encourage you all to do that. Uh, as you may know, all the grades in this course are TP, Thesis and Progress, so um, uh, there isn't any sort of um, splitting hairs or gradations or hierarchies in the grades. And that will be true for your thesis all the way through. When you're in the thesis process, all the grades are uh, thesis in progress, thesis in progress, until finally, I think, when you finish, it's an S or something. Mike will be dealing with that because you'll be with him in the, in the thesis studio as you, as you wrap this up. Um, any questions before I move into the last piece of what I want to cover? Title, the table, the community, the abstract, the diagram, the table of contents. As far as the community, what is the two like? Just the names, that's it? Yeah, just the names. If we wanted to present to you our bibliography so we can update it, can we submit that also? Wait, stay again? If I updated my bibliography, can I submit that also? Uh, sure. Well, because I'm your chair, <laughs> give me whatever you want, I'll take it. But the bibliography is not required for the class. Okay. You know, if, if you've got some issues around uh, resources, um, um, yeah, well, I'll, I'll take whatever you've got. Okay. You know, if you've got pieces of chapters, I'll take those too. Any other questions? So the last thing you'll be doing for me is turning in that packet in my box on Friday by the end of the day. All right. Um, I don't know how much attention span you've got left, but I want to I want to talk a little bit more about research um, to kind of to finish rounding out what we started. We began a treatment of research last time, and we got so far with it. Uh, but we really, in what we treated last class, was sort of an introductory walk around. Now I want to get into some some meatier aspects of it, where hopefully you'll see some connections between, let's call it the world of research and the thesis. Um, and this, is this isn't just sort of uh, uh, general information. I, what I want to convince you of is by understanding research per se, you will better understand the spirit and tone and intentionality of thesis process, because thesis is embedded in the larger world of research. And by understanding the larger world of research, you can understand why certain things are asked for in the thesis, 
why certain emphases are placed in certain places in the thesis. So uh, it's, it's to try to make sure you're clear what this world is that you're inhabiting right now. And, and it, is, it is the world of, of uh, research. And there's a lot that can be said about research, but I want to cut to the chase um, because I want to make sure I finish what I've got to say today. Um, so let's, let's move into some things that hopefully you'll see do directly apply to you uh, as what you're doing hangs on the larger plane of the research. So we've got some, some uh, levels of research. We've got pure research. I'm going to talk about what these are in a minute. Pure research, basic research, uh, applied research, an issue investigation. Uh, without getting too long-winded about this, pure research is um, is looking for first principles. In other words, how does the universe work? The phrase you hear a lot in physics and in astronomy and quantum mechanics is the unified theory of the universe. Uh, scientists believe that right now we've got all these theories of different things, but at some point they all converge to one single idea out of which everything else tumbles. So it relates to the astronomer version of the Big Bang. Um, so it's looking for first principles. What are those laws and principles that govern what we see? Uh, and this, this tends to be kind of a playful. Uh, exploration here. It's not looking at any particular problem. It's usually rooted in physics, but not always. Basic research is a little more pointed, <coughs> but it's also looking at uh, it's also looking at uh, first principles. In other words, you're you're trying to understand how something works. So here's where you're searching for a cure for cancer, for example. You're looking at how cells work. And what is the anatomy of a cancer cell? And how does it divide? And those kinds of things. So it's still looking for first principles, but there's a focus to it. Uh, and so it's, you can see it's beginning to move toward more and more pointed and applied sort of uh, flavors. Applied research is, is basically problem solving. Applied research would be uh, let's come up with a material that will span further. Uh, the whole notion of forensics research is an applied research. Uh, when a building falls down, or when in 9-11 the Twin Towers collapsed, the forensics research tried to figure out what the mechanics were of that failure. And so applied research tends to be focused on a particular situation, whereas basic research may be applied to a, a condition like cancer, but it's not applied to your cancer or my cancer, it's applied to cancer in general. Basic applied research is that thing. Applied research is this kind of structure. Issue investigation is where you're just looking into something. It, it tends not to be as scientifically driven as these are. And you can see that we're drifting towards what feels more like the thesis. So on this scale, none of you guys are looking for the unified theory of the universe. You're not trying to cure cancer. To some extent, you're doing applied research, to the extent you're, you're trying to solve a problem. But most of you are really looking into issues. You're saying, I wonder what would happen here. Or let's see what the uh, outcome of this particular kind of path would be. The thesis tends to live in the bottom range of this. The only people who operate at the top are quantum uh, mechanics. Uh, scientists and physicists and uh, astronomers and, and those types. Most of the time architects are not assuming what the first principles of the universe are. Now there's an interesting relationship between creativity and critical thinking. <coughs> As you'll see in a second, Creativity is necessary at the beginning of the process, where you're trying to imagine what is this thing I want to look at, and how can I conceive a way to get at it. 
critical thinking is, is when you're immersed in it and you're trying to put ideas together to drill into it. So creativity generates the subject matter that critical thinking is applied to. And critical thinking uncovers new questions that require creative thinking. And I think that's something that operates in science and in research uh, pretty regularly. This pairing of creativity and critical thinking is, um, is a pretty standard uh, sibling relationship in research. Creativity being instinctual, intuitive, uh, non-linear, uh, non-rational, and critical thinking being rational, logical, uh, being able to put your ideas together in kind of an argumentative or, or uh, stating the case kind of way. They are very different muscles, as you know, uh, because architect architecture requires that you develop both sides of yourself. And those two things are very much at work. Uh, I think in your thesis, I think all of you are being asked by your thesis topic to be creative and to visualize new configurations and ways of moving and ways of working. Uh, you're trying to creatively see the implications of your, uh, your issue, uh, and and then when you're when you're in the issue itself, when you're doing the analysis part, you're, you're very much needing to do critical thinking logic together and can explain things and defend things. Um, so that pairing is, uh, is very much at work for, uh, for both research in general and for us. Um, now we can talk about forms of research. One form of research we'll say is writing. That seems to be archival. And we'll see where I'm going with this in a minute. <laughs> the other one in, involves observation. In other words, looking at how the world works. So in this kind of research, you're in the archives of the Indies and Madrid, and you're looking at the correspondence between the explorer and the king, and you're trying to figure out something. Okay, that's not looking at how the world works. This is looking at uh, correspondence or somebody's... Uh, you're looking at the, the, the laws of Rome that had to do with uh, solar access. This is going out into the messy world and looking at how things work. And there's flavors of observation. So this can wind up in description. Uh, it can wind up in quantitative. Results and they can wind up in comparisons. Let's say a couple of things about those. So these are all flavors of observation. What about a description? Description, an example of a descriptive uh, piece of research that's based on observation, is you go live with a tribe in New Guinea for a year and you describe their, uh, their eating habits. Okay, so that would be observing and just describing. You're not doing an experiment, you're just watching and describing. Or using my example a couple of classes back, I'm sitting in the piazza and I'm observing the behavior at the portals to this particular place. And I'm writing down what I see. That would be a description. I'm not acting on it, I'm not interfering with it, I'm not doing any sort of special analysis. And just observing and describing. So that's one kind of research. Quantitative, as the name implies, is, is counting things. So if I started counting the people coming through the portal, it would be quantitative. This tends to also get into statistics, uh, where you're getting into uh, uh, okay, how many how many students graduate from the school. What were their grade patterns and which classrooms were they in? Can we be, begin to infer relationships between the environments where they were taught and their learning capacities? And we'll begin to apply math to figure out whether the spaces were uh, likely and probable as influencing factors or not. So anytime you're bringing numbers to bear uh, on the 
to switch. You're into the quantitative area. Uh, and quantitative can also be happening in the comparative area, uh, but the tone of comparison is, is um, until it's off in a slightly different direction. And this is where you tend to get experiments. So comparisons is where uh, I have a control group, let's say a profile of people of certain genders and ethnicities and ages, and I have an experimental group, and I'm going to give these guys a pill, I'm not going to give these guys a pill, and I'm going to see whether the group I gave the pill to winds up getting better healed than the group I didn't give the pill to. That's a uh, pretty simple example of a comparison where you're doing something here, you're not doing it there, and you're comparing what you did it to to what you didn't do it to to see what the impact was on those that you, you applied your, your change to. Um, so using the school example again, uh, and here obviously you've got to be careful, you can't ruin people's lives and make a comparison, but let's just say I'm going to do a uh, an experiment with, let's say, lighting in schools. And I'm going to deliberately set up 10 classrooms with this lighting level and color rendition. Uh, and I'm going to have a, a, a standard lighting that the school district requires every year. And I'm going to work it for two or three semesters, and I'm going to see whether this change over here uh, had an effect or not, either up or down. Now, that probably wouldn't happen because you can't jeopardize educational quality by tinkering with things that might be graded. But I'm trying to give you an example of how a comparison might work. Uh, so whenever you hear about experimental design, you're usually in the comparison design. Now, what does that mean for us in terms of, uh, in terms of thesis? Well, I think you're all into descriptions. I don't think anybody's setting up an experiment here. Most of you are asking questions like, what would it be like to immerse myself in this area of scholarship and then tease out design issues from that area of scholarship and apply those issues to the design of architectural form. And then when you're done, you're going to be describing what that was like. Now you could be setting up a um, you could be setting up a comparison where you do a project one way with conventional logic and you wind up with, let's say, a set of spoons, and you, then you deliberately import these issues that were not at work there, and you see what the scheme is down here. That would be an example of a comparison. Uh, most of you are not going to be applying quantitative um, methods to thesis. So the thesis tends to, tends to gravitate here. In some cases, uh, some of you are looking at comparisons um, as, a, as an aspect of your thesis application. Now what I want to work, run into or, or go to is uh, the scientific method. You know, what, what does it mean to set up an experiment? Um, and then what I want to do is look at how the thesis process maps onto that, because in some cases, we track a scientific method pretty carefully and pretty closely with what we do in the thesis. And in other cases, we take a right turn and we go off and do other things. So I want to, I want to end by making a comparison. So I'm going to put a real quick list up here, and then I'm going to talk about this is, this is the typical way scientists would describe what they do using the scientific methods and also concentrating on the comparisons and experimental uh, uh, focus as far as those forms of research are concerned. So area of interest. That sounds familiar, doesn't it? They all started with that. So all work starts with something you're interested in. Now, if my work is 
uh, <clears throat> cancer, then I'm already in that zone, and now I've got to refine it just like you do. So what do I do next? Then it becomes with no, it moves to noticing. We're noting things, we're curiosity. You know, I note that forms seem to take a certain kind of twist in that geographic zone. I wonder why that is. I think I'm going to look more carefully at that. Or I, my mind begins to serve up some question having to do with twists on sustainability. Or, uh, you know, can we have spiritual experiences in secular buildings? My mind begins to move to a question mark within your areas of interest. And then it moves to a hunch. I'll bet those roofs are that way because of rainfall and soap. Or I bet they lift their huts up off the ground because of something gross. Or I'll bet if I totally dedicate my building to sustainability, uh, it's going to have a very mechanical oil riggish aesthetic. So I move to an owl bet kind of mentality. Or slightly softer than that, I move to an eye monitor mentality. Um, so you can see there's a, a little tighter focus beginning to happen. And then I move to a crude question. And I say crude because the first question we ask is usually pretty blunt and not very incisive. Um, but it's beginning to ask the specific question about roof form and climate. I'm going to bet that uh, these classes of roofs tend to happen this way in every climate that has a lot of rainfall. I'm going to look into that. Well, now I'm beginning to aim myself in terms of, uh, in terms of research production. Then I get into the question re refinement. Uh, can I ask the question in a more telling way, a more incisive way? Uh, it may not seem the case on first blush, but it is very true that if I ask the question this way, I tend to set off in this research direction. Whereas if I ask the question this way, even though I'm interested in the same body of information, my research implications take off in this way. So refining the question. In your case, you're refining your topic. You're trying to get more incisive, more sharp edged, more clear about what it is you're exactly uh, committing yourself to looking into. And then, if we continue with the, the scientific spin on this, we arrive at a hypothesis. Hypothesis means under the thesis, like hypodermic. A hypothesis is an I'll bet state. This is where I declare what I think is so. Another term for a hypothesis is a truth claim. I'm gonna I'm gonna bet, I'm gonna claim that in every rainy climate I find these kinds of roots. Okay, that's an I'll bet state. Or I'll bet that there is always turbulence in the circulation patterns right at the apertures of the entrances to piazzas. Okay, I've noticed that. Now I'm going to declare that I think it is so. And everything after that is going to be to see whether it's so. And everything after that's going to be to set up and set up some sort of a study situation or an experiment or some way of looking into that that will either prove it or disprove it. And I'm going to be just as happy if I disprove it as if, as if I prove it. Because if I disprove it, then I know that's not the truth. Something else has to be the truth. I've avoided a wrong belief. I've, I've avoided a wrong stance in terms of the way I think the world. Um, so that's the, that's the point at which you begin to get very uh, 
focus, very serious about what comes next in terms of the prophecy. Then you move into looking at the literature and the state of the field. You don't just launch off and do things from scratch. If I'm looking at turbulence as the apertures of entrances to piazzas, who else has looked at this? What did they say? What are their studies like? Um, who's the hero? Is there somebody who's doing a lot of work in this? In other words, I've got to, I've got to get smart about whose shoulders I'm going to climb on. I don't want to pretend that I'm starting from scratch because most of the time you're not starting from scratch. But you certainly have. You look into the literature within the topic that you've chosen to look at. And then you do your study design, which is uh, what you did with your uh, thesis diagram. In other words, what does this investigation look like? What are its pieces? What are the relationships between the pieces? What are the operations I'm going to perform on it? Uh, what are the, the actions I'm taking? Or in a nutshell, what am I doing to what? Or what am I doing with what? What, what are my action types? I'm not just going to wade into it and wallow around in it. I've got, to, I've got to have some plan with which I enter into it and operate it. Uh, and, and you guys are, are certainly into that with your thesis diagrams and what that means to your analysis component and also to your application of your research to your, to your designs. Um, now, study design, if you're a scientist, it's going to take on a certain kind of form. And that's where, we, that's where the experiment comes in. That's where I would decide I need a control group, meaning a, a group of students, who I'm going to measure uh, their learning, but I'm going to leave them alone. In other words, they're the, they're the baseline group that's going to tell me what, quote, normal is. And then there's going to be an experimental group that I'm going to do things to. I'm going to change something about their experience. I'm going to give them a pill. I'm going to have them all read this book. I'm going to change the lighting. I'm going to counsel them, but not these guys. Uh, I'm going to make these guys come at 5 a.m., but not these guys. In other words, I'm going to waggle something. I've got a control group, and I've got an experimental group. I'm going to measure normal here, and I'm going to waggle something right there. And what I waggle has to do with my I'll bet I'll bet that, if, that lighting levels affect learning. Okay, well, what am I going to waggle? I'm going to waggle lighting. And I'm going to measure learning. Here, lighting is normal, learning is normal. I have baseline information here. I'm going to change this and measure it and see to what extent that outcome is different from this outcome. And that's where statistics come in. Whenever you set something up experimentally like this, you're usually having to uh, hire a statistician because. This may be different, but a statistician will tell you the probability of it being accidentally different or significantly different. And you have to run numbers on things to know whether uh, something is significant or different. <coughs> so you get your outcomes, you, know, you get your data, you have your measures, and you do your charts. And and then you begin to do your inferences. You begin to conclude whether this is meaningful or not, or whether you, your hunch turned out not to be true. Lo and behold, I thought that when we changed lighting, uh, learning was going to change in this way, but it didn't change at all. Or not only it didn't go up, it went down. Or not only went down, didn't go down, it went up. So science has a whole list of ways that research has slippage. There's the Hawthorne effect, there's the Pygmalion effect, there's the John Henry effect. All of these are terms that scientists use to describe 
uh, conditions in the world that confound meaningful implications. Hawthorne Effect, for example, is named after a, a town in California where um, uh, their, their hypothesis was as lighting increases, mistakes on the manufacturing floor go down. Um, and conversely, as lighting goes down, mistakes go up. So here they are, and here's one part of the factory where they don't fool with lighting at all. They've got those measures, they've got all this sort of averaging and data and all that stuff on the way widgets are normally made and air away. And now there's another part of the factory where they're going to tinker with lighting and measure mistakes. Well, they dropped the lighting and the mistakes went down. They dropped the lighting again and the mistakes went down further. They dropped the lighting again and the mistakes went down further. So not only did it not prove or get a hypothesis, they were getting opposite results. The Hawthorne effect is, if I know I'm being studied, and you're measuring my performance, and you start messing with things, I'm not going to let it bother me. Matter of fact, I'm going to show you how good I am. <laughs> and so these guys learned that they were being tinkered with, and they hitched up their pants and outperformed these guys. Even though what was being degraded was supposed to affect their error rate, it went the other way because they paid another level of attention. Those are examples of slippages that happen in this research that you have to be careful about. And science has got a big long list of those, which I'm not going to get into now, but I wanted to give you at least one. Uh, so you're very aware when you set these things up where are the places that's likely to leak, where are the places that are likely to get slippage, and to what extent does that erode the confidence I can have in my results. Uh, and that definitely. Is that work at least in spirit of what the, the way you guys pursue your thesis? Uh, so you, you move from here to your findings, which you are going to be. You're going you're to step back and you're going to observe. You're going to impart lessons. Uh, you're going to reflect. You're going to share the wisdom that you learned from your thesis. Uh, in other words, you're going you're to conclude. And as we've said all along, it is perfectly okay in the thesis to have started the whole process with a hunch and to have concluded with the fact that your hunch was wrong. Uh, you may find out you can't get spirituality in the airport. It is perfectly okay at your thesis presentation to say, you know, I banged my head against this wall and tried everything I could, but certain building types will not receive this, this intention. And all of you are facing things like that. It may be that you find out that the collage affects only this part of the building, or collage was only indirectly able to be So it's really important that you not just plow ahead with your findings and write it up as though everything was just you know, peaches and cream. You've got, to, you've got to ruthlessly critique where you got to in your exploration and share that wisdom, even if some of it isn't what you expected or even if some of it's not what you wanted. Because one of the aspects of the spirit of science is you, you tell the ruthless truth, truth no matter where the process has led you. That's the wisdom we want. We don't want sugar coated wisdom. We don't want spray painted wisdom. We want what was it like really in that trench? And what can you tell us now that you've come out of that trench? And you can, you can tell us now what that journey was like and what were those lessons that you brought. <coughs> and so for me, the beginning of the scientific method is very similar to us. You know, you're starting murky and you're tightening up. And you're getting clearer and clearer and you're more and more, and more in size of it until you're picturing what it is you've got to do. And you all have just lived that and you're living it now, so we can, we can appreciate that. 
And I think the other end, the bookend, is also similar to us. This thing's going to come to a close, and you are charged with reflection, teasing out implications, sharing the wisdom, critiquing the process and the product, uh, and basically taking it apart and writing it up um, with all of its pluses and its minuses. The difference is in the middle. It's in experimental design. You, know, you guys aren't working with control groups. You're not waggling one little factor over here to seeing whether the control of the experimental group changes or not. And so to me, it's the body, the middle part of the scientific method that's different. Um, and really, there's sort of two tones here. Uh, one scientific one is the I'll bet statement, which is to propose that you think the world works this way, and you're going to see whether it does or not, uh, using those examples that I, that I mentioned a minute ago. The thesis tends to feel more like asking the question, I wonder what would happen if I use minimalism in the other I wonder what would happen if a totally dedicated in art and architectural form to biomimicry uh, inspiration. I wonder what would happen if um, you know, I, I, I entered into this using this influence and trying to totally dedicate the form to uh, being responsive to this influence. So it tends to be a little soft thing. It tends to be more of an investigative journey. You're not setting it up like a scientific experiment. But there have been pieces that were more like that. We've had several, um, not recently, that did post occupancy evaluations on this building of a technical nature, investigating leaks, for example, and trying to get to the bottom of why certain things leaked. A very technical, very focused, very problem solving. So that wasn't some arty exploration or something. That was looking at a particular technical configuration and trying to figure it out. So that one took on more of the tone of a science project versus an artistic term. Um, let's see if any other things I want to point to before we wrap this up. Maybe that's enough. Um, there's a lot more that can be said about this, but the main thing I wanted to do is to impart enough about this world of research to show you that you are in a let's say, a, a ideological environment that has certain kinds of um, uh, certain kinds of things that are considered success criteria. And that might be worth putting up here as a, a sort of a finale to this. So if I go to a science meeting and I'm gonna I'm gonna present my results, and here are these skeptical people looking out here uh, at what I'm saying what are the kinds of things they're looking for that will tell them whether I'm, I'm on the right track or not? These do apply to this. One is the principle of parsimony. Parsimony just means economy. Uh, Occam's razor, which says the simplest explanation is usually the true one. So if I use quantum physics to illustrate parsimony, the simplest formula that explains the most phenomena is the most parsimonious. And so the, the elegance and efficiency with which you conduct your study and the incisiveness of your findings, the pointedness of your findings, uh, that's, that's striving toward parsimony as opposed to him ending with some rambling uh, narrative that really doesn't say much and just sort of fills two or three pages in order to say you wrote your conclusion. In other words, how clear, how pointed, how incisive uh, are your findings going to be? No anomalies. Anomaly just means uh, a quirk that doesn't fit. Um, my theory about lighting and learning worked, except for this screwy school over there, 
where the data just didn't follow my theory. Another word for anomaly is leaks. A study that leaks or has slippage where you've got so many things that don't confirm your hunch, that's not a good thing in science. So you're trying to come up with a study and a study design where you head off the possibility of leaks. And that has to do with how skillful you are in designing studies. Somebody who does a, a better study design will design out the possibility of certain leads, whereas other people will set up a study configuration or a thesis diagram that has leaks built into it. And so being able to be confident about your findings is what this is about. Can you really say things with confidence? Now also, by the way, this is what leads to uh, you may have heard of Thomas Kuhn in the book, uh, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions. Uh, Kuhn says that it's the buildup of anomalies in science that lead to ruptures and a whole new uh, arrival in a whole new paradigm. Um, the fact that uh, Newton's mechanics and astronomy had anomalies in it were what led Einstein to totally reconceive the nature of space. Anomalies do have their purpose because they show that the theory of the hypothesis isn't quite uh, registering perfectly with the world. Uh, <coughs> explanatory power. So once the theory is confirmed, how much of the world does it explain? This is the search for uh, the unified theory of the universe. So explanatory power. Uh, does it help me explain things? And companion to that is potency. Does this allow me to act in the world using that set of assumptions and be successful? Okay, so if my theory has to do with interpersonal relationships, and that behaving in certain ways will lead to smooth friendships. And I go out in the world and I try it, and everybody I try it on punches me in the nose. Uh, there's not much potency there. In other words, there's a misfit between the way the world works and the way I thought. So potency has to do with the fit or the registration of the idea of the way the world works. Uh, precision or accuracy. For example, one of the things that science scientists are very uh, concerned with are um, uh, internal and external integrity. Internal integrity means the studies free of bias. Now this is where I go in and I study something, but the way I set it up didn't, didn't make me leave my baggage at the door. Okay, this is, this is why you have oftentimes double blind studies, where even scientists who are doing it don't know what's going on. But these scientists over here who designed it set it up so that the ones who are executing it can't guess what's going on. Um, so internal bias, which has to do with the slip of stuff. External bias mean, uh, has to do with the, the fit of the work. External bias means that uh, uh, when I take my theory out into the world, if I design traffic patterns in the city, because I think it will go smoother, and I set up my stoplights that way, and you know, everybody's having rips and corners and honking their horns, then that's got a lot of external bias. And then the last one's replicability. <clears throat> In other words, can I repeat it? So one of the first things that scientists will do when they hear some new theory trotted out at a conference, they'll go set it up and they'll try it and stuff. And they'll see whether they get the same results. Now, I don't know whether uh, nobody has ever come in here and said, I think I'm going to take George Smith's, Smith's thesis from the uh, uh, 2001 and replicate it and see whether I get the same findings. That would be a valid thesis. 
replicate a study and to, and to compare your findings with them. Um, so replication to check things out. If you can't replicate, then you can't test the veracity or the truthfulness of the theory. You have to be able to repeat. So remember a few years back, somebody said they found, uh, what is it, fission or fusion? They could use water as a nuclear fuel. And then when they started replicating the study, they found out that wasn't true. So replication is the way scientists check up on one another to see whether somebody's going to smoke or not. Those criteria are the pieces too. Okay, so that was a little bit of a sprint to get through it. Um, there's other stuff that can be said, but to me, that's the, the nub of, of the, uh, the aspect of research that can be mapped on the thesis or, or vice versa. So uh, you guys are launched. I've enjoyed the, <clears throat> the journey um, with you guys getting your things formed. So uh, wish you all luck in the second term wrapping these up. You know what's needed now. You know what the picture is. And so work carefully with your chairs to wrap it up. I'm sure Mike will be appraising you of dates and products and deadlines and what the <coughs> what the end process is going to be. So I'm, I'm looking forward to your final presentation to see what, where else is led. Okay, have a good break. Good luck in your exams.